Hi, my name is Marianne Anderson. I'm a haematologist here at Peter McCallum and uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital. I've got a special interest in chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. And you might be wondering what chronic lymphocytic leukaemia is. Chronic lymphocytic leukaemia is a low grade B cell malignancy. So let's talk about B cells. B cells are um, part of are white blood cells. They're made by the bone marrow. And healthy B cells are really important for us to fight infection. So we all have B cells, and um, in most of us, those B cells produce immunoglobulin and help our immune system to remember bugs so that we can fight those bugs. In some individuals, usually due to um, accumulation of random genetic mutations that occur throughout the course of an individual's life, the healthy B cells can change from healthy B cells into malignant B cells. And these malignant B cells are characterized by having both CD19, which is a normal healthy B cell marker, as well as CD5, which should never be found on healthy B cells. And that co-expression of CD5 and CD19 on the surface of the B cell marks the B cell as, an, as a CLL cell. You don't just suddenly go from having normal B cells to CLL cells though. What we see in people is that uh, they initially develop this population of CLL-like cells with the co-expression of CD5 and CD19. And often this population of cells will be quite low. Such individuals are said to have a monoclonal B lymphocytosis. And those people may have that disorder for many, many years and it might never ever cause them a problem. In a small number of patients with monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, for whatever reason, and we believe it's due to acquisition of additional genetic changes, the, B cell pop the, the aberrant B cell population increases. And that person develops enough of those abnormal B cells in their blood to change the definition from monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis into chronic lymphocytic leukemia. One of the things that we need to be aware of when talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia is that it has a sister disorder and the sister disorder is small lymphocytic lymphoma. Small lymphocytic lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia are the same disease. They are genetically they are the same, the treatments are the same, and the prognosis for patients is the same. The difference between CLL or chronic lymphocytic leukemia and SLL or small lymphocytic lymphoma is that the, disease, the abnormal B cells in CLL tend to circulate in the blood so we can do a blood test and see the abnormal cells, whereas in SLL, those abnormal cells tend to sit predominantly in lymph nodes. So patients with CLL might have a high white cell count, whereas patients with SLL tend to have large lymph nodes. But the two diseases can over time and do typically come to look very similar and are often indistinguishable. So a patient um, has a diagnosis of CLL or SLL. What kind of tests might the doctor do? A very common test is a bone marrow biopsy, and that's to look at the place where blood cells are made to see how much of the bone marrow is involved by the disease. Patients will often have a CT scan from the neck all the way down to the pelvis to look for large lymph nodes, which are a common manifestation of the disease, as well as a large spleen or liver, which are also very common. We also monitor blood tests. Patients with CLL and SLL often develop problems like anemia, low platelet count, or low normal white blood cells. They often also have a high uh, lymphocyte count, and this lymphocyte count um, is due to the malignant cells in the blood. Your doctor will often test you for um, special, with special tests such as flow cytometry, and that's to look for that uh, population of CD5 and CD19 co-expressing lymphocytes which define this disease. Your doctor will often also test for genetic aberrations which we know are present in CLL. Some of the uh, genetic markers that we look for that indicate um, good and bad prognosis include uh, FISH studies, which look at um, the genetic markers uh, 13Q deletion, trisomy 12, which tend to be associated with better outcome, 
all the uh, genetic markers 11Q deletion or 17P deletion, which tend to be associated with worse outcomes. Similarly, the karyotype, uh, if this is complex, that often portends a worse outcome as well. Increasingly, we're looking at the immunoglobulin heavy chain mutational status. Patients in whom the immunoglobulin heavy chain is unmutated have a worse outcome compared to patients in whom it is mutated. We also use next generation sequencing to look for mutations such as p53 mutation, which also carries a worse outcome for patients. So there's a lot of testing that your doctor will do to try and ascertain the extent of your disease and also the genetic prognostic factors. Patients with CLL, um, it is often a very slow growing disorder. And so many patients with CLL only know they have the disease because it was found on a routine blood test. And for many of those patients, the disease does not change for many years. And I have patients that I've been seeing for years and years who come and see me once a year, they have a blood test, the blood test has barely changed, we have a social chat and I see them again the year after. Unfortunately for other patients, the disease does progress over time. And when the disease progresses uh, to such a point that it needs treatment, we have to start thinking about the best treatment options for the patient. I usually start to have these conversations with patients in whom uh, manifestations of the CLL are becoming apparent. The manifestations that I always look for in my CLL patients include low blood counts, anemia, low platelets, so thrombocytopenia, or low normal white blood cells such as neutropenia. I also look for B symptoms, so these include fatigue, poor energy, drenching night sweats, unintentional weight loss. Other symptoms that I ask about include infections, unusually severe or unusually frequent. I'm also interested in feeling for lymph nodes. Patients in whom the lymph nodes are becoming very big and bulky also require treatment. So when patients get to the point where they require treatment, then we have to make a decision about which treatment paradigm we're going to go down. In my practice, I think I divide patients into two groups. Those patients in whom um, I believe that they are fit to receive uh, high dose chemotherapy and the high dose chemotherapy that we use at our centre and many other centres is fludarabine, cyclophosphamide and rituximab, commonly called FCR. We know that patients treated with FCR will achieve, uh, can often achieve very deep remissions and when patients achieve very deep remissions, these remissions can be long lasting. And to date, the best results in terms of long lasting deep remissions are still with FCR. Unfortunately, FCR is a very traditional chemotherapy and it's associated with a number of side effects. And as patients get older and um, have more other health issues, their ability to tolerate the side effects of FCR decreases. And if I don't think it's safe to give a patient FCR, then I talk to them about a different treatment paradigm. And that treatment paradigm in our centre is chlorambucil and abinutuzumab. This kind of therapy is outpatient chemotherapy as well. It's given, the chemotherapy component is given as tablets and there's a monoclonal antibody that is infused each month. The FCR therapy um, is similar outpatient therapy, but it's given over three days every month. It contains two traditional chemotherapies as well as a monoclonal antibody. There are a group of patients, however, in whom I don't want to use traditional chemotherapy, either chlorambucil and abinutuzumab or FCR. And those are patients in whom I know that the genetic risk factors of the disease mean that the responses are not going to be as good. And the classic group of patients in, who, in whom that we refer to when we're talking about bad outcomes with chemotherapy are the patients with P53 mutation. And so for that group of patients, I try to explore access to different types of treatments, so novel agent therapy, uh, because I know that the outcomes with the traditional chemotherapies are not as good. So uh, basically we treat patients with chemotherapy, either FCR or chlorambucil and abinutuzumab uh, for six months or so, and then hopefully the patient achieves a remission and will stay in remission for some time. In the case of FCR, this can be many years indeed. 
we follow the patients until such time as their disease relapses. And when the disease relapses, at that point, uh, I would typically explore a novel agent therapy for the patient. Uh, there'll be a talk soon on novel, specifically dedicated to a particular type of novel agent therapy called venetoclax. So I'm not going to talk in great detail about venetoclax today. However, just to give you an overview of the novel agent therapies that are available, uh, typically speaking in our, um, today, 2019 in Australia, we have access to two different types of novel agent therapy on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. These are venetoclax and abrutinib. Both of these agents are associated with um, impressive clinical responses in patients, even in patients in whom the disease is relapsed and refractory. They both have um, different uh, toxicity profiles and they both achieve uh, slightly different things. So abrutinib uh, very rarely causes patients to go into complete remission whereby there is no evidence of disease. However, what it does do is it forces the CLL cells out of the bone marrow, out of the lymph node and into the blood where the CLL cells are more easily killed. Um, and what we find is that many patients uh, can be in remission, so have very little disease on board for many, many years with abrutinib. So it holds the disease at bay without eradicating the disease. So it's a very useful disease, uh, treatment in, uh, that we can use to keep patients well for a very long time. Of course, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. And some of the side effects that we see with abrutinib include um, heart arrhythmias, uh, which can be very troublesome indeed. We can also see br bl uh, bruising and bleeding. And in some patients, there can also be problems with infection. Venetoclax, on the other hand, um, is a drug that uh, works by killing the CLL cells and killing them very efficiently. And so many patients treated with venetoclax will eradicate all evidence of disease. However, um, while venetoclax is very efficient at reducing the burden of disease in the short term, the median time that patients uh, experience remission on this drug is still about two years. So even though you can eradicate um, a lot of the disease with venetoclax, it doesn't necessarily mean that your disease will be well controlled for a long time. The, the great benefit of venetoclax in eradicating disease is that for patients in whom you wish to move to an allogeneic stem cell transplant, you wish to, those patients need to have very little disease on board. And so venetoclax can be very useful at eradicating evidence of disease as a bridge to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Venetoclax, however, um, has a different toxicity profile and that needs to be considered in deciding whether you want to go down an abrutinib route or a venetoclax route. So venetoclax, the main problem with that drug is that in patients in whom the disease is very bulky, so more than five centimetres of lymph nodes or a very high white cell count, those patients can experience sudden death of the cancer cells when they first dose with this drug. And as the cancer cells die, if you imagine billions of cells dying all at the same time, that can be associated with um, dysfunction of the various organs. So the, cancer, the toxins are released into the blood and that can affect the kidneys and the heart. Um, and so there have to be very strict protocols in place to prevent uh, this condition called tumor lysis syndrome from resulting in patients getting very sick when you first start with venetoclax. So, we're very lucky in Australia today that we have access to these two drugs, uh, but uh, the, you have to weigh up uh, your individual patient's needs and their other health issues in terms of deciding which one is going to be best for the person in front of you.